Good morning. Well, if you are uh, willing and able, we're going to be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. So if you're willing and able, please stand for the reading of God's word. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all, were in, and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. So we are still in our series of Unstoppable in this book of Acts. And uh, we're going to be looking at the dark hours, the very literal dark hours of Paul and Silas in the story of Acts 16. Um, and how all of us, at some point in our lives, we have or will go through a very dark hour, a very low valley, a time where we feel like we hit rock bottom. Um, for, for those of you guys who don't know, I grew up in Hawaii, uh, a very isolated place. <clears throat> I grew up on the island of Kauai. It's very isolated and beautiful. We are about 2,500 miles-ish away from the nearest landmass in any direction that you go. So we're pretty isolated. However, just because we are isolated and it, we're really far away from a lot of things, that does not mean we're isolated from sin and the rest of the pitfalls of this world. Um, and with that being said, my father, growing up, uh, was addicted to, to crystal meth. Um, and he was also selling drugs from our home. But I didn't know it at the time. I was, I was a little kid. All I saw was my dad awake for five, six, seven, eight days at a time, and then he would sleep for five, six, and seven, eight days. And my dad was a grumpy man when he was sleeping all the time um, because of the drugs and, of course, because he was sleeping all the time. So we were afraid of him at times. But one Saturday morning, there was a call. It was a house phone. We didn't have cell phones back then. Uh, house phone rings. And I answer the phone. It's a Saturday morning. I, I answer the phone. And, the wo and there was a woman on the other line, on the other side, and, and she said, Hi, can I speak with your father? And I reply with, um, I think he's leaving. He's about to go somewhere. And you hear the click and a dial tone. So you know she hung up. And I take one more look around outside in our driveway, and I see my dad in handcuffs. The DEA proceeds to come to our front door, sits my dad down, presents a search warrant, and they begin to search our house. They find nothing except for a bag of crystal meth that was outside of our property line. Of course, court hearings and all of that stuff proceed afterwards. My dad is tried, um, and he's sentenced for, for roughly five years and possible deportation. And when the morning came where my dad was about to be taken away, when they put him in handcuffs and they took my dad away to jail, I had hit my lowest point. That was my low point in my life as a 13-year-old boy. 
I went to school that day, and I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. I was angry at my dad. I was angry at the police. I was angry that they took him away. There were times where I, I hated my dad at some points because of how mean he was, because of the verbal abuse that would happen. And then I was angry at myself because I hated him, and yet it was taken away from me. And for me, being 13 years old, I didn't know how to express my feelings. I didn't know how to express my emotions. Went to school that day, everything was a blur. I came home, and there was this BMW, a really beat up BMW that my dad and his friends would work on when they were high. And so I found a, a big old three quarter inch wrench in my dad's garage, and I proceeded to bash everything that was smashable. Glass, plastic, everything. And I just let out my emotions, because I didn't know how. I didn't know how to respond in this dark hour. Now, if I had responded like that now, as a Christian, not the best way to glorify God, if you guys were wondering. And I see that now. But when you're 13 years old, or even when you're young in your faith, sometimes we don't know how to respond when adversity hits. Today, we're going to be looking at Paul and Silas and how they, they were on a mission from God. They were doing God's good work. And a little background, they, they were wrongly accused of a crime. And they were put into jail. They were tried. A, ha a hearing that was kind of just thrown together by the local people. They were beaten. They were shamed. And then they were thrown into the innermost prison, the innermost part of a prison, and then had their feet bound in wooden stocks. And now we're going to see how they responded to their dark hour. They responded in two ways. Paul and Silas responded with, they praised God through song and prayer, and then they preached the gospel in their dark hour. And these two men lead by example of how we ought to respond as well when we get into our dark hours. So let's go into verses 25 and 26. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. These two men were in the, the maximum security cell, wrongly accused of a crime, their dignity taken from them, their honor taken from them. Sleep is evading them at this point as well, and their wounds are still oozing blood. Yet they had just seen God open the heart of this woman named Lydia. And her and her whole household was baptized. They had just exorcised a demon from a girl and freed her from the spirit. But then they were beaten and thrown into jail after these two amazing things that they had just seen and experienced. And yet even in the most inner part of this, why am I so loud? Even in the most inner part of this jail, even in their shame and this dark hour, they were praying and they were singing hymns to God. Paul and Silas responded this way because they knew people were watching them. The other prisoners, the, 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 the prison guards were watching them. They were being watched. And the prayers that they prayed were not silent. They prayed out loud. And the songs that they sung weren't just a tune that got stuck in your head. But they were sung with purpose, with intention. They were sung with praise and glory aimed at the Father. So now I ask you, 
How did you respond the last time adversity smacked you in the face? Did, you res did your response spark curiosity in the unbeliever as to why you can find joy right now? Or did your response affirm the assumptions of some unbelievers that, that when push comes to shove, your faith in God wavers? That, oh, you just go to church to look good. That you don't really believe in what you're praying and what you're singing about. To praise God when things are peachy is easy. It's so easy. But to praise God when maybe your spouse has cancer, your father gets thrown into jail, when your marriage ends in divorce, or when the Lord takes someone home a little bit too soon for you, is, is very, very difficult. But we know from, from God's word that when we face trials, we must consider it pure joy because this testing of our faith produces perseverance. And we can consider trials and, and adversity pure joy because of the virtues and the deeds of God are always good. Not, we don't give God glory because his gifts are good. We give God glory and praise because he is good. And one practical, one very, very practical way that we, be, that we can begin to sing praises in our darkest hours is very simple. Put in some tunes from the Joy FM. I know that sounds corny, but that's true. Put on some tunes that remind you of God's glory and remind you of his goodness. Open up that hymnal that's right in front of you and sing about God's grace, God's goodness. One of my favorite songs I like to listen to, especially when I'm feeling a little bit down, it's called Praise You in the Storm by Casting Crowns. And I want to read the lyrics for you. I would sing it, but um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, I was crying earlier, so my voice is not so good now. <laughs> I had my guitar ready and everything, but nah, I'm good. So anyways, we'll, we'll go right into the lyrics. So this is Praise You in the Storm by Casting Crowns, and I just want to read you the lyrics. It says, I was sure by now, God, you would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen, that it's still raining. As the thunder rolls, I barely hear your whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. Music has a way of expressing emotions saying words for us that sometimes we can't find on our own. Paul and Silas knew this. They knew that the psalms that they sung, the hymns that they sung in praise to glory, they knew these words in their hearts. And they expressed emotions in a way that most of us can't explain. Music triggers something different in us. Music speaks to our soul. I love it when lines of a song just like this get stuck in my head because I can meditate on that truth. So the next time you are in your dark hour, first thing you can do is put on some praise. Start singing praises to him. Let that tune get stuck in your head on repeat. If you guys ever seen the movie, um, what is it I'm thinking of? No, never mind. But when you get that tune stuck in your head, let it meditate it, meditate on it, chew on it, and bask in that music. And another way we can begin to express some of the emotions we're feeling, in the, especially in that dark hour, is to open your Bible to the Psalms. 
The Psalms have words of, of pain, of anger, trials. The Psalms also have jubilation, triumph, praise, and most of all, remind, reminders of how good our God is. Because even when the psalmist is writing about how he feels forsaken by God, he always comes back to the goodness of God as well. Meditate on the truth that God is always good. People will see the way you act. Unbelievers and believers alike will see the way you respond in your dark hour and begin to wonder why you're responding with joy. Even though most would probably give up or just shake their fists at God saying, why me, God? Why take away that person from me? However, once we spark curiosity, we can begin to preach the gospel to all who are willing and seeking to hear about this joy that you have even though your world may seem to be falling apart. And that brings us to our second point, is that yes, we will preach the gospel. Paul and Silas preach the gospel in their dark hour. Let's take a look at verses 26 through 27. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. All night, Paul and Silas were singing and praising God. And then this large earthquake comes and shakes the whole prison. And the timing in which Paul, uh, Luke writes this and describes this event suggests that there was divine intervention at this point. Paul could have allowed the, the jailer to just commit suicide. And then he could have hobbled out of prison, all beaten up. But Paul stops him from doing so. And the jailer at this moment knew that there was something different about these two men. That there was something different about these two prisoners. Curiosity had sparked at this point. And not just curiosity, but there was a legitimate fear. This pagan man kind of connected Paul and Silas to, to this earthquake. And he was right. But it wasn't Paul and Silas who caused it. It was God. However, when this jailer fell before Paul and Silas, this was the moment that God had opened the door for them to begin to preach the gospel. So we'll move on into verse 30. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. From the moment Paul and Silas were brought into jail, all eyes were on them. They'd been accused of a crime that was of religious matter, and they made the most out of this opportunity. They saw it as an opportunity to suffer for God. Praising God in their darkest hour spoke louder than the trials that they were in. And it also gave them an avenue to then preach about why and how they could find joy in this, what seemed like a very dire and dreadful moment. And so what did Paul do with this opportunity? 
what should we do with the opportunity that we have when we are faced with our dark hour? Well, after you praise him, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Paul began to preach the word of the Lord to the jailer, and not just the one man, but his entire household. We too must preach the gospel with our, with our words, with our actions, and the relations that we build. We, whether you know it or not, are preaching the gospel to everyone you come into contact with. Most of us are pretty much creatures of habit. We like to frequent the same stores. Maybe you have a certain allegiance to a certain Publix because that Publix is better than other Publix three blocks away. I don't know. But most of us are regulars somewhere. Maybe at the Starbucks, a certain hairdresser that you visit, um, maybe a gym, wherever you're, you're regular at. That is a, a little way for you to build relationships. <clears throat> now, my point is that at the very beginning, of course, these relationships can seem very shallow. But for some of you, I know if you've experienced that if you go to a restaurant enough, you may get the same server all the time. And you interact with the same people all the time, wherever you go. And sometimes that, that very shallow relationship of, hey, how are you? I'm doing good. What can I get for you? Can turn into, hey, how are you? And you respond with, I have a big surgery coming up. My mother is in the hospital. Sometimes you will spill your guts to what seems like a stranger, but you've been building a relationship. However, your response to the burden, even though you've told, about it, told them about it, preaches or doesn't preach the gospel to this person. But if you're hurting and still praising the Lord, then you may have already sparked curiosity in this small relationship that you've built at Publix, at big gyms. God will open doors for you when you least expect it. And those doors will be open even more so, especially when we're suffering, when we're going through dark hours. And once you spark curiosity in the people that you interact with, that is just the beginning of your preaching assignment. You will need to continue to praise God, especially when you're in your darkest hours. But don't confuse praising God with putting on a fake smile, putting on a mask and saying, everything is fine. And then when you go home, you have a conversation with a bottle of Jack Daniels. It's okay to show hurt. It's okay to show anger. But don't waver in your faith. Be genuine in your walk. People can see genuineness. People can see authenticity. And be genuine also, especially in your praise to God. And preaching the gospel may take years, may take months, may, maybe even a day. But know that it will take time. Our job is, is to not change the heart of the person that we're interacting with or the people who see our hurt, but our job is to preach the gospel and make disciples of all nations. God is the one who takes care of the change in the hearts. And then finally, the last thing we do after we follow these two things, after we follow Paul and Silas' example, is that we pray. But pray specifically that God can use our struggles, our hurt, to further his kingdom. That God can take what people see right in front of them 
a hurt person, a broken person, still praising God and further his kingdom. That we can pray for the seeds of truth that you're sowing into, into the lives of the people you interact with and to grow it into something amazing. Now, Paul and Silas, they had a very short relationship with this jailer, um, but the impact that, was, that happened was very huge. So let's, let's pick up in verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to the house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. The jailer responded in a very odd way. And it was odd because he was, a few verses ago, this, this prison guard was ready to kill himself because he thought all the prisoners had escaped. But now he took Paul and Silas to some water and began to wash their wounds. And then he was baptized in that water afterwards. I, I don't think, yeah, yeah. So he was baptized in that water. He and his whole family. And then he brought them food, brought them into his house, and ate with them. Now this is interesting because feeding prisoners wasn't the job of the prison. In this context, the the feeding of prisoners was the duty of friends and relatives. So if a jailer didn't have any friends or relatives, he had to make some friends really quick. Or if somebody was in jail, they had to make friends really, really quick. And it was against the law for the prison guard to feed prisoners and to even bring a prisoner into their home, obviously. I'm pretty sure correction officers don't like to bring prisoners home with them. But it was illegal. For, to do so. And of course you could face death if you did. So this, pr this prison guard went from wanting to commit suicide because he thought he just failed his mission to guard these prisoners to willingly putting his life on the line to now serve his brothers in Christ. And not everybody will respond the way this jailer responds. Not, not everybody will respond quickly to the gospel or even this enthusiastically to the gospel. And that's okay. It will take time. And some people will even doubt that you're praising him in your dark hour. But still, be genuine in your praise and be so bold with your praise that it should be undeniable and that it shines brighter than the burdens that you're bearing at that point. As Christians, we are not called to a life that is easy, but we're called to one that mimics the example set forth by, by Christ. Jesus suffered the most excruciating and humiliating death and he is the only good person that had something bad happen to him. We say it all the time. Why did something bad have to happen to such a good person? But the truth is, we are inherent sinners. There is no good person here on this earth except for Jesus. Jesus is the only good person that had something bad happen to him. Jesus remained sinless he didn't deserve death, yet he willingly went to the cross to be killed. But God uses suffering to further his kingdom. If it wasn't for suffering, the people in the book of Acts would have never went out. The apostles would have never left each other. Suffering is what God uses to further his kingdom. Each and every one of us will suffer or have suffered in one way or another. But that is how we give glory to God. And for us, what we can pray for is to pray that God can use your suffering 
to further his kingdom. Begin to pray for those relationships that you're building at your regular circles, the regular places that you go to. Pray for those people and the relationships that you are building or maybe just starting to build. Pray that they too can someday want to, be, want to believe in Jesus as this jailer did and also want to be washed of their sins. And one simple way you can show the people in your life that you care for them is to ask them how you can pray for them. Because people don't care about what you have to say unless they know that you care for them. They want to know that you care about them, that you care about their hurt as well. Because as Christians, we will suffer. That's a promise. But we as Christians never suffer alone either. We have a body of brothers and sisters that pray for one another. And whether people in the secular world want to admit it or not, they, they want to place their hope in something, whether it's money or person or whatever it may be. For us as Christians, we have Jesus Christ. We have Jesus to place our hope in, an eternal hope in. And of course, as I said before, it is easy to praise him when we're skipping across the mountaintops, when our bank accounts are full, when our health is great and everything seems to fall into place. That's, it's easy to give him praise. However, praises for God always seem to have a hard time passing our lips when adversity swirls and hits you all at once. Our response to suffering can either spark curiosity in the unbeliever or show unbelievers that we don't really trust in the God that we preach and that we worship. But when we praise him in the most difficult sufferings, the darkest hours, and the lowest valleys, then we give great testimony of how great how amazing our God is and not just the gifts he bestows upon us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and we thank you for our sufferings. We thank you that you give us trials to go through. And though at the time it may seem unfair or too difficult Father we know that you use it to further your kingdom and I pray that we can still praise you in the storms that we can praise you in our dark hours that we can praise you in the lowest deepest and darkest valleys and we, we give you thanks and praise for all that you do we ask all this in Christ's name Amen